a paradigm shift. Those are the words that Dr. Mark Steiner uses to describe sustainable public procurement development. Dr. Steiner has been judge at Swiss Federal Administration Court since 2007 and has been dealing with sustainable or better general public procurement and economic law. He was also an expert uh, invited to a public hearing on modernization of public procurement at the Internal Market and Consumer Protection Committee of the European Parliament in May 2011. He also contributed to a revised guidelines uh, for sustainable public procurement of the United Nations Environmental Programme and took part in two sessions of World Trade Organization concerning sustainable public procurement. Dr. Steiner, uh, you as a Swiss judge has your tips of fingers on the on the blood pressure of uh, procurement in Switzerland. And there has been a uh, interesting development in Switzerland, in Switzerland, as I understand. Uh, since 2021, beginning of this year, there has been a new legislation supporting sustainable public procurement. Indeed. Since Switzerland is not obliged to strictly follow European procurement directives, where did the new sustainable public procurement rules came from? Where do they originate? And what are the main sources of inspiration uh, for Swiss legislation? Thank you for asking that interesting question. Also in a political, uh, let's say, term, because it's not only about law, but also, also about politics when we discuss sustainable public procurement. And for Switzerland, it's true that they don't have to apply the European directives. They are not even in the European economic area, but they have a bilateral treaty with the European Union and public procurement, uh, let's say, laying a common ground in order to be more or less integrated anyway. So it feels like being in the European economic area. So de facto, Switzerland was very much inspired by the European directives, but they would never admit that because at that time, the tensions between Switzerland and the European Union are there because an institutional agreement failed. But at the same time, we really took over the ideas of the European directives when promoting sustainable public procurement. So we were very much inspired by the European Union directives without admitting it to our politicians. So the administration copy-pasted European directives without saying so to the politicians, but everything went well. And so it's very pragmatic. Thank you very much. Uh, further, um, there are new rules or new regulations governing sustainable public procurement mm -hmm. itself. Uh, are sustainable public procurement aspects in any way mandatory in Swiss legislation or are they used on voluntary basis? Oh, Jesus Christ. So, so I should answer with yes and no. <laughs> okay. So the first thing is that sustainability is aim and purpose of the new law. So it's an article two. Every legislation has its aims and purposes, like equal treatment, transparency, you, you name it. And at the same time, Switzerland said, for us, sustainability is an integrated part of the notion of best value for money. So sustainability has become aim and purpose of the law itself. That's really big achievement. Ten years ago, that would uh, strictly have been impossible, unthinkable. And now we are there, so it, it's really, that's why I call it the paradigm shift, because it really has a considerable change. And now to your much more precise legal question, what is mandatory and what is not? We, you have to imagine that like a bathtub. When taking a bath, you need a solid underground of minimum standards. And those are mandatory. So there are red social minimum standards, green environmental minimum standards. And if you don't comply with those as bitter, you're excluded. That's what I call mandatory in the strict sense of the term. And then at the same time, which is, however, 
of equal importance is how do you treat abnormally low bits. So that's the third part of the bathtub to being having the obligation of the procuring entities to ask questions when they are confronted with an abnormally low bid. So you have green aspects, social aspects, abnormally low bid, and this gives you the anti-dumping bathtub, I call that, yes? And that's mandatory. And within that, when designing technical specifications and award criteria, you are obliged, according to the new Swiss law, to use quality as an award criterion, but you are not obliged to use sustainability in every case. But if you have the aim and purpose of sustainability, it would be difficult to entirely disregard sustainability aspects when designing technical specifications and award criteria. Sorry for the long answer, but it's a difficult question. It was a very, <laughs> very, very good answer that covered two other possible questions I might be having. Uh, and that's uh, something you called anti-dumping tap. Yes, uh, and uh, from some points of view, uh, actually sustainability might contravene uh, other uh, other principles of procurement such as such as uh, equal treatment or equal opportunities of uh, of uh, economic operators uh, how do you see this uh, working together those two aspects do they necessarily uh, contravene themselves and fight with each other wow what a deep question. So the, the point is that we have first, we should discuss the, the, the link between competition based on quality and sustainability. So back home, the economy operators, they wanted competition based on quality first. And I told them, if you sell that together with sustainability, you will have the majorities to have the new law as you would like to see it. So, so you have to put together innovation, competition based on quality and sustainability as a concept. That's the first thing you have to know. And now we are coming back to your interesting question, doesn't this contravene with other principles of public procurement? In the 90s, the majority of lawyers would probably have said yes because at the time we were in a neoliberal mindset where we had market access, competition, money, and nothing else as an approach. Sustainability was called in German for Garbefremd, which is strange in a public procurement concept. And from that view, of course, you would let's say, point out the conflict between, uh, let's say, market access and the new design of public procurement. But according to the new directives, you have competition based on quality, you have sustainability and innovation as integrated parts of the new directives. So there is a new view on how absolute the predominance of market access should be. You have to make a balance between the old style of absolute market access focus and the new vision. And if you take a good balance, then you're in the new philosophy, in my mind. Thank you very much. So it might be actually superfluous to ask you whether sustainability has or has not its place in procurement legislation, right? Yes, <laughs> according to me, of course it has, because uh, before those new directives 2014, th that German concept of Vergabefremd, strange to public procurement, was predominant in Germany. Everyone used uh, Vergabefremde Aspekte. And after the new directives and after the new German legislation let's say, implementing the EU Directives 2016, there was a legal scholar saying at the most famous venue conference in Germany and public procurement, 
now we are not allowed anymore to use the term strange to public procurement, which is in German for Kappelfremde Aspekte. So this might show you how far this paradigm shift is going. So, and since uh, sustainable public procurement is, has become a trend uh, and uh, has probably even reached you in your day-to-day -day practice, uh, what are the topics uh, that, have been deal, uh, that have been dealt uh, in Switzerland in sustainable public procurement? Which are the most important or more frequent topics uh, that contracting authorities focus on? So what really is at core of the new thinking is life cycle costs. So what I see that the Swiss administration is, is really focusing on is, is, is trying to give the instrument in the hands of the simple buyers, let me call it like that, to handle this. I mean, life cycle costing is something very complicated. The, the, the old fashioned neoliberal public procurement framework from the 90s of the last centuries, they had the advantage of being rather simplistic because if you need only market access, competition, money and nothing else, it's less complicated. But let's face it, the new thing is designed to make the picture of the real complexity of supply chains. So we want less collateral damage and more real cost thinking. And if we want to have that, it gets more complicated, let's face it. And in order to help people to deal with that, we are trying to, to prepare, let's say, like uh, guidance for what could be life cycle costing when considering different products and services or construction. This brings me to another question. Uh, you mentioned that original procurement was more, let's say, simplistic. It was mm -hmm. hard as well, but more simple in yeah. uh, concepts and instruments uh, from some point of view. That's why it gave that much of collateral damages. If we would have pursued that way, the planet would have no chance, let's face it. We have no other choice than use sustainable public procurement as a tool to achieve Green New Deal, green recovery, or if you use the Joe Biden terms, build back better. Whatever you name it, you use sustainable public procurement in terms of a real change and inventing something like a new form of capitalism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your answer. And uh, I might have some, be having some other, some further questions mm -hmm. regarding uh, topics or instruments, because as far as I heard, um, gender equality uh, from the perspective of remuneration has been also a topic in Swiss procurement legislation. Uh, what is the approach or uh, how, do, how do contracting authorities tackle uh, such a complex issue as a gender yeah. pay gap uh, or gender equality in remuneration in public tenders? Yeah. This is also one of the minimum standards of the bathtub, let's call it like that. And if the bidders back home don't comply with a minimum on gender equality on, on payment of salary, they are out. But the point is that it's not really, you should make real assessments. So, so normally it's based on self-declarations and, and that's not enough. So, so you have to inquire about how, how is your salary system and are there, let's say, is there a gender problem within the figures of, of your salary you pay in your enterprise and stuff like this. So when you go really inquiring, then uh, the Swiss enterprises are not happy at all. So they are satisfied with having the law and the self-declaration, but it's really inquiry that's different. So the right-wingers 
uh, let's say they gave the idea to the parliament to cut down the budget of the gender equality authority after having inquired too much in, in the equality of the salary. So, so if you are too serious about it, then gives you a backfire. So, so it's, it's a politically difficult balance, but we are approaching, let's say, kind of next step. And the next question might be covering one of the topics of tomorrow's conference, which is mm -hmm. food and uh, catering uh, mm -hmm. procurement, uh, especially topics like seasonality or regionality of the product yeah. might be very tempting to use in public procurement. Absolutely. What would be the loopholes or risks uh, or what would be the optimum, uh, optimum way uh, to pursue those logical yeah. uh, aspects without contravening with, uh, with uh, competition and with free movement of goods and services. Absolutely. So five minutes ago, we have discussed mindset layers. We have said there is a neoliberal mindset, uh, market access, competition, money and nothing else. It was the 90s. And before that, there was protectionism. Protectionism, uh, let's... Uh, not open markets and, and uh, favoritism and stuff like this. So the first layer, the, the, the most archaic, <laughs> if I'm allowed to put it that way, was protectionism. The second was neoliberal, market access, uh, competition, money and nothing else. And now we have the third one, competition based on quality, sustainability and innovation. And we must be very careful that that third one is not used to disguise the return in the first one, protectionism. That's not the idea of the game. And when we come to food catering, I'm personally rather progressive. I, I say you can go relatively far in terms of seasonality on, of food or fresh food, because if you say, I need fresh salad, it's clear that the distance of delivery cannot be 200 kilometers, but it's perfectly uh, as long as I don't say where precisely the salad must be from. <laughs> so if I just say, I would like to have fresh salad, and this means that it implies that it's not from, let's say, 200 kilometers away, to me, it, it fits perfectly well. It's no problem. But if you are in, in the mindset to market access, competition, money, and nothing else, you would criticize that approach, of course. But I think those times are rather over. You mentioned before uh, the difference between really simple instru instruments and more sophisticated instruments, yes. not just for... And this salad thing is the perfect example. I mean, it gets more sophisticated. It it's definitely clear. is. It's less easy. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you have to imagine that those are contracting authorities who have to deal with new requirements Definitely, and uh, yes. form uh, the market with their new demands and new, using new instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be the perfect way, what, not perfect, but what would be appropriate way to prepare or to help mm. uh, the contracting authorities yeah. to strive and yeah. to, to survive the, uh, the struggle uh, fi with finding new instruments and new ways of procurement? Yeah. So the first thing I already addressed wa was uh, guidance, so, so material to, to, to help people how to deal with those cases. And the second thing is an education initiative. So we have decided back home that if really we want to get the philosophy of the new law in, into people's heads, we need to have a, a massive education initiative especially at federal level, there are ambitious plans to say, hey guys, we need more education on this. And also we have new let's, certificates for education, which is specific in that context. So what we try to have uh, public procurement 
uh, education as a specific title uh, for educated people and, and, and public procurement was never considered to be a real career. So, so if you were thrown into public procurement, it happened somehow. And, and according to the new system, you, you can get your certificates. I'm, I'm an educated public procurement specialist and this changes the whole thing. And I hope also that will lead to the fact that buyers are better paid. I mean, you need more people dealing with public procurement. You, you should invest in human resources and you should also invest in more smartness. So, so this costs more money also in the human resource department on the public procuring entity side. So the authorities have to develop an education and HR concept when implementing the new law. That's an excellent point. And I will just uh, ask additional question whether sustainability or sustainable public procurement should be, let's say, not a cornerstone, but integral part of this curriculum of a procurement specialist. Or should there be procurement team and someone from the procurement team should know something about sustainability. Mm -hmm. what, would mm -hmm. be, what would be the perfect solution in your private eyes or in your private uh, view? Jesus Christ, okay. So, so let's say the first thing we need to have is a procurement culture because the normal buyers want to avoid obstacles. They don't they don't have the courage to go for using the discretion they have. They have huge possibility. I mean, the margin of appreciation of a procuring entity when buying something is huge. They have, according to the new law, amazing possibility, but they don't use it because they want to have cover my ass policies when buying stuff. And, and what I tell them, hey guys, we need a culture encouraging courage. If, if you make a mistake, you're, you're not cut the head off, but, but let's learn and come. So, so, so we need a different culture. And the second thing is, we are coming out of an organization where we have the real hardcore public procurement stuff in the central procuring entity and somewhere in another ministry, someone interested in social aspects and in the environment ministry, someone interested in green public procurement. And this is over, ladies and gentlemen. If we want to get the deal through with the new law, we need to have those specialists integrated into central procuring entity and there must be an entity sustainable public procurement like they're doing in Germany in the Ministry of the Interior, so-called public procurement office, Beschaffungsamt. There is an integrated sustainability team and then it goes to mainstream. No one wants to listen to someone in the social or labor ministry or of the environmental ministry, but if the sustainability team is an integrated part of the central procuring entity, then it goes to mainstream. That's my firm conviction. I cannot agree more with you uh, <laughs> on this topic, obviously. Uh, and uh, since, since, well, we actually covered, uh, kind of covered uh, those topics, but just you being a judge, which is very important if a judge who does the review of procurement speaks about courage of the contracting authorities to try I to I do innovate. this in a personal capacity. This is, of course, not an official statement of, of course, the course. Of course, of <laughs> course, but it does sound very encouraging. Uh, but uh, let's say, uh, imagine that you can, let's say, make a recommendation or a good tip how to make sustainability work in public procurement. And especially with regard to uh, review because sustainability in procurement means also more work for you as a review authority. Uh, 
what would be something that helps you understand where, where the thoughts of the contracting authority went or uh, aimed? Uh, because you, obviously, if you see sustainable aspect in procurement, you might be asking questions, is that used? What's, what's basically the background? Mm -hmm. What's the reason of mm -hmm. using this criteria? Was it restriction of the market or was it really finding a good solution to yeah. a problem? What would be the help for you to say, okay, this makes sense. This actually uh, is a one of the signs that indicates that might be really used in a systemic way, some mm -hmm. uh, long-term perspective and really used as getting extra value and not, for example, restricting the market itself. Yeah, yeah. So, so what's really important is a proper documentation of the procurement procedure so one can like assess what the reasons were to integrate a criterion or something like this if there is nothing written about it uh, one starts getting suspicious <laughs> and, and and the second thing is the overall concept of, of the procurement we had back home in canton uh, a little community saying I want my services from not more far away than 10 kilometers distance and because it's much transport involved when it comes to dealing with the rubbish. So, so it was uh, a special service uh, for taking away the rubbish and so they told for environmental reasons, we don't want it to be more weight than 10 kilometers where the firm comes to, to deliver that service. And at the same time, they were not at all interested the trucks which Euronorm they had in terms of environmental performance. So you could easily guess that there were protectionists at work and not environmentalists because if not they would have asked the questions which you are norm your trucks have when getting away to rubbish. And, and so this little difference gives a judge a view uh, whether it's really sustainability intention or disguised protectionism. Excellent. I do believe that we covered most of the topics uh, connected uh, to sustainable public procurement. And uh, I might be asking you for just one last message. What would be the message uh, you would like to uh, send to the contracting authorities with mm. and maybe even politicians with regard to sustainable public procurement and maybe sustainable public procurement being part of the politics of or being part of the public discussions? Yeah. It, it's very wise to mention politicians because the problem is politics has not understood what public procurement really can be. They consider as a technocrat's matter, as a bureaucrat thing of some administration freaks uh, specialized, but an ordinary politician doesn't need to be interested in. This is absolutely false not only because there is so much money in, obviously, we know it, but also because it's a giant lever to build a new form of capitalism. If you want to go to Glasgow and present a climate strategy, you need to tell people how you use, how you invest your money. That's a giant lever. And the second giant lever is how your supply chain looks. And, the, and if you combine those two, then you can save the world. So it's a giant lever and, and you cannot achieve anything in climate politics or in Green New Deal or in green recovery without using public procurement as a political instrument. And we as public servants have to help the politicians to develop a new narrative saying, hey guys, this is one of the giant levers to build the future, not something a technocrat's matter. And if we, let's say, can pass this message, then the battle is won, according to me. 
thank you very much for the interview. Thank you very much for uh, your very encouraging and inspiring last words uh, or uh, closing words. And uh, well, uh, welcome to Prague. And I will be looking forward to your presentation during our tomorrow's conference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your very interesting questions.